I wanted to build on what we explored last week about why and how to meditate. And the reason why I think this topic is extremely important is because generally uh, there are many recommendations that people try to meditate, uh, whether it's in the um, boot camp for Marines or for people in business, uh, busy parents, uh, handling stress, coping with loss, whatever it might be, recovering from a heart attack, you know, a lot of recommendations floating around in the culture, for better or worse, about meditation. And related to that, um, supportive practices uh, that are adjacent, like mindfulness or compassion or self-compassion. So the topic is in the air, isn't it? And in the context here of a, a buddhist uh meditation uh, gathering, uh, certainly the Buddha himself strongly recommended different kinds of meditation as ways to train the mind and purify the mind and kind of crowd out uh, stressful factors that promoted suffering and for other purposes as well, such as to uh, foster genuinely enlightening, genuinely liberating insight into the nature of mind and existence altogether. So it's helpful to reflect on why do we meditate and what are the different reasons for meditation for different people, for different purposes, for different situations at different times. And last week I talked about, for me, a kind of simple, basic way of thinking about why do we meditate in terms of five major purposes that overlap and build on each other. And for each of these, uh, last week I talked about um, how to do it related to those purposes, because our hows relate to our whys. Um, the five purposes were, first, just resting your weary head, as someone brought up in the chat sidebar related to this week's Just One Thing newsletter. Just rest your weary head, relax, chill, disengage from the whole circus around you and inside you. Whew. Just plop. Maybe you let your mind wander. Maybe you just sit on the sofa. You just kind of let it go. But, you know, you're purposeful about it. That's a basic form of meditation. And I think it matters. I think it deserves credit. Whoosh. A second major why in meditation is to train attention, to develop greater concentration power through different hows related to that why, like picking a particular object of attention, such as the sensations of breathing, and becoming deeply absorbed in it, even following that out, those depths of concentration, sometimes called shamatha practice, um, depths of concentration moving into non-ordinary states of consciousness, which are valuable in their own right, and which also foster liberating insight. So that's the second major purpose training of attention, training of mindfulness, training of concentration. A third major purpose is, in addition to cultivating greater concentration power, other f cultivations, such as developing a greater warm-heartedness, a lovingness, developing greater inner calm, resilience, building inner shock absorbers through meditative practice so that we're not so knocked when the waves of life come at us. You know, they come at us and we're rattled, but we're not totally um, capsized by them. We don't drown in the storm, all right? So the, that's a cultivation, cultivating happiness, cultivating peacefulness, cultivating non-attachment, uh, cultivating secure relationships, whatever it is you wanna cultivate. Um, and then a fourth major purpose is the cultivation of insight. Insight both in terms of kind of at a gross level, uh, the causes uh, and effects of different uh, uh, forces inside your own mind and different forces around you, more or less, what promotes happiness and welfare for you and others, or what promotes suffering and harm for you and others. You know, insight into those relationships between cause and effect in, in a gross sense, and also, in this fourth why, there can be insight into the nature of our experiences 
as always having three characteristics, impermanence, compoundedness, in other words, they're made up of parts, uh, and um, dependent arising, interdependence with other things, including inside our own minds, uh, so that no experience has absolute self-existing identity on its own. These three qualities, as we develop growing insight into the nature of our experiences, could be summarized in the technical term of emptiness. Not emptiness as in void or non-existence, but rather empty of uh, substance, empty of identity, empty of ownership. And this insight into the emptiness of all experiences their kind of foamy insubstantiality, the fact that they're streaming along ownerlessly can bring us into a liberating insight into the emptiness even of our sense of self so that we can take life less personally in ways that can become extremely freeing and liberating. So that's a fourth major why liberating insight, the cultivation of vipassana in Pali, in the language of early Buddhism. And then the fifth why that I'm kind of loosely categorizing, and these whys are not mutually exclusive, they build on each other, don't they, is, as I talked about um, before we formally began today, if you were here for that, the why of um, returning to or becoming rested in our deep, true nature, or some beautiful, valuable, precious ground of being that even could be transpersonal, that underlies everything. It's kind of like, call it being, call it mystery, call it true nature, Buddha nature, the ground state, Rigpa in Tibet, in Dzogchen, you know, when there are no impediments, when there is no clutter, when there is no, there are no hindrances, there, there are no cravings, who are we when we're undivided, without craving, in the present, and opened out into everything? Whatever that might be whatever, however you name it, right? Abiding as that is, I think, a fifth kind of why. Okay, so we have these whys. It's a loose model. It's my model. See what is useful in it. And then related to that, we have different hows that I talked about last week. And if you didn't see last week or, or hear it, you might really want to. Um, and so now I want to speak to some questions that have come up. People have emailed me from last week. I want to respond to that. I also want to speak to a general question about the fact that some people who engage in meditation, especially in intensive forms, intensive forms like on retreats, some people um, occasionally report adverse experiences, including pretty significant adverse experiences, even sometimes psychotic breaks or manic episodes or other kinds of things. And I want to speak to that. All right. Uh, so with regard to a question, and then I'll take a look at comments that have come in to um, uh, the chat. And I'm getting comments that I'm kind of hard to hear. I don't know why I would be hard to hear. Oh, maybe someone turned down the gain. Oh, hey, how's this? I'm turning up the gain. Is it better? Serena Black, I'm seeing you. You're my go-to. Hang in there. All right. Is this sound okay? How did that happen? Or maybe this is the gain. Hang up. How about over here? Can you hear me better now? A little better? Sounds okay? All right. I'm going to leave it there. Okay? You can hear me really well. You know, you might want to turn up the volume at your end too, right? But I'll, I think I did it. I think I got it. Okay, I'm going to keep on going. Okay? All right. And now, these questions about meditation, though, are related to lots of other things too. All right. So here we go. 
Um, let's see. I won't say the name of this person, of either of the two people who've emailed me. So a person emails me and says, first of all, I have no idea what warm-heartedness is or how that's supposed to feel. My heart is the organ that pumps blood and keeps me alive. This person was responding to my comment um, that one of the ways to support meditation is uh, to have a sense of warm-heartedness, friendliness, compassion, love even, you know, joy at the welfare of others, uh, tenderness, uh, sweetness in the heart. You know, these are uh, examples of factors that some people report help them meditate. Uh, neurobiologically, in terms of our evolution, the sense of positive connections with others is a primal signal of safety. You can relax, you can let go, you can be present. You don't need to be stressed and vigilant, always scanning around, which is kind of the opposite of meditation. So I named uh, warm-heartedness as one of multiple factors that can help to steady the mind. And this speaks to a larger point, which is that Unless a person is able to just drop in to complete stability of meditative presence, most people are not there yet. Um, I've been meditating a long time and my mind will still wander sometimes. Um, it's helpful to cultivate various factors inside the mind or in your environment that promote uh, the way of being that you're, you're valuing such as a meditative way of being during that particular time or even in general. So you try to get certain factors going and sometimes you just can't get them going. You can't feel warm-heartedness or you relate to it in a super concrete way. What do you mean warm-heartedness? I don't relate to that suggestion. And that's okay. But the larger point is that um, our qualities of being or states of mind are the result of various factors. They arise dependently. There are causes and conditions of our states of being. So we might as well um, you know, take charge of that process to the extent that we can and help ourselves to have states, in other words, kinds of, of experiences that are useful, that are beneficial, help ourselves have states, and then in particular, help ourselves learn from those states to, so that they become traits, so that increasingly we become rested in a natural kind of ongoing, unconditional background, let's say of warm-heartedness or determination or emotional balance, all of which facilitate meditation. And so these are increasingly the way we are. It's this two-step process. I've written about it a lot. Well, you know, it draws on what's called positive neuroplasticity, in which we try to help ourselves experience what's beneficial and then internalize that experience, learn from it, so it becomes increasingly hardwired into our being as a trait. That's okay. All right. And if you but if you but if you're trying to get something going as an experience and you can't, it's probably because it's not yet developed in you as a trait. So the takeaway might be, oh, if you would value that as a trait, such as warm-heartedness, then it follows that it would be helpful to try to foster it in, inside yourself increasingly as a state. What I'm describing here is the fundamental process of self-directed growth, self-directed healing and change, in which we help ourselves have those experiences, one way or another, that are useful, enjoyable, beneficial for ourselves, and then crucially, in the often forgotten but crucially important second step, we can take in the good of these experiences so they become increasingly present in us and over time um, go with us wherever we are. That's a fundamental process. So then second, uh, this person writes me, I try to meditate every day and have tried numerous guided meditations, but I have the same reaction to meditation whenever I try. My meditation, my reaction to meditation using the breath is that I begin to hyperventilate and I can feel my heartbeat driving me insane. I just can't take the feeling and hearing my heartbeat. Even if I try to concentrate on something else, I keep feeling my heart beating away. 
it literally drives me to anxiety. Is there anything that I can do, I can try, to get over this reaction? There are many important things in what this person is saying here. It speaks to, first, the great diversity of people and temperaments and backgrounds and natures. And a method that is routinely suggested may not work, usually will not work, for everyone. And there's, there's no shame in that. It just doesn't work for you. And there may be reasons for that. Perhaps there is a, a great deal of body awareness for all kinds of reasons so that body sensations become almost invasive or overwhelming. Uh, there could be anxiety for different kinds of reasons relating to the body. Just becoming aware of the body could promote anxiety which is often the case actually, particularly in certain um, areas of um, kind of primal survival like breathing or the heartbeat continuing uh, for people who've had trauma in their history. So suggesting to them that they take as a meditation object the sense of the breath or body sensations altogether, it's counterindicated. It's not good for them. And so it's really important to try to find other things. Generally, what we're doing when we're meditating is helping ourselves come into the present. So anything that uh, distracts us into the past or the future is an obstruction to that aim of coming into the present. And we're helping ourselves feel increasingly undisturbed and undivided and, and home, like we're okay so that there's less and less basis for the ordinary habits of craving and drivenness and stressing, which we already have a ton of in our life. And when we meditate, we're looking for something other than that, including often qualities of calming and centering and, and comfort for ourselves. You know, we're, we run around so much these days. You know, we need to come back to the nest and settle in. That's all right. So. If something like being aware of the body gets in the way of that, then it's counterindicated. So alternatives include things like listening to sounds that are peaceful, like put on like some background new age music or something maybe of sounds of the ocean or the forest or birds or whatever you find comforting and settling. Maybe that's a really useful meditation object. It might help perhaps to walk and focus on sensation, let's say in the feet. Or as you walk, just get a sense of the room around you or the environment around you. And when you get distracted into any particular thing, let it go and widen your perspective to everything. Maybe that's your meditative practice which neurologically has some pluses to it in that sense of openness, expansiveness, and the eyes, the gaze, moving up to the horizon line. Um, these are alternatives to meditation objects that are really disturbing. And this goes to a more general point that I'm gonna be getting into, as I said, about safety. Safety first, and establishing practices that support your sense of safety. So if for you, you find that a practice is upsetting, alarming. Walk away, probably best to drop it. Over time, there might be some information for you that would be interesting about what is it about that practice that you found particularly disturbing. Maybe over time, <clears throat> if you think that the practice would actually be helpful, such as deepening body awareness, maybe, or deepening a sense of warm heartedness, but it's, it's hard to get at, or when you try to get at that, it's very upsetting. Sometimes you might conclude that it would be good to focus on growing other resources first that can help you then, let's say, tune into your body or find a sense of warm heartedness or anything else, let's say, um, that would be helpful to you. you, know, you so you resource yourself to be able to get to the result you care about. And sometimes it's appropriate to do that, but often, it's just the case that, you know, that mode of practice just doesn't work for you. I'll tell you one for me, a traditional instruction and a very good one 
from Southeast Asia that's helpful for many, many people is to what's called note your experience. Just kind of quickly label uh, the experiences you're having in the streaming of consciousness. Well, when I tried to do that, I'm quite aware, I'm quite mindful of all kinds of experiences, including ones that are very granular, that are happening very rapidly and very granularly. And I just was like, ah! I was like the proverbial millipede with a, whatever, a thousand legs, probably less than that, um, when it gets all freaked out when you ask it, which one is it gonna move next? There was just something about it that just didn't work for me. I've known other people who, paying attention classically to the sensation of breathing around the upper lip or nose would give them a migraine. It would just uh, be too contracted, even though it's a traditional instruction that's offered to many, many people. It has been for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. It just didn't work for them. So if there's something about a practice that just, it just feels really wrong for you, please, it's okay, back away. Try something different, pull out of it, stop meditating altogether, or shift to a different kind of meditation, or um, shift to a different kind of uh, personal growth-oriented activity, like maybe journal about the experience so you could kind of get a sense of understanding it and wrapping your arms around it. You know, pull out. Pull out of what's not working for you. Okay? All right. So another question, then I'm going to open it up to those of you who want to ask me questions here. All right? Um, Let's see here. I just want to see if there's anything else in the chat. Okay, good. All right, great. Good. Okay, one more person. Um, let's see here. I'm going to summarize a, a question that has come in. Um, this person says, so I, I recently joined the Wednesday evening meditations, you know, someone who's, you know, just kind of beginning a meditative practice, uh, although definitely someone who's engaged my material on neurodharma, some deep material there, and uh, clearly has a, an interest in real practice. Uh, so this person then writes, uh, I find lately that I'm a little more irritable during daily life, almost like my intentions are not panning out off the cushion, or I can't access the spaciousness. I don't know, but I'm wondering what you make of this. Is this unique for a beginner? All right. Uh, and then this person writes, um, uh, so maybe the answer is simply, stick with it, kid. <laughs> and if so, I get it and I will. All right, so I, I, I would not say that, really. <laughs> kid. I was still clear of that kind of tone. But anyway, um, several things here. So one is that, uh, you know, the irritability could be completely unrelated to practice. You know, correlation is not necessarily evidence of causation. It might be, but not necessarily. So maybe there's just other stuff cooking around. Second, um, sometimes practice, and this is a big one, whether it's mindfulness or you know, infor you know, informal everyday meditation at home or more formal long retreats, things of that sort. You know, you think of that on a kind of a gradient. Uh, mindfulness in general, definitely meditation and certainly things like retreats can really op lift off the trap door and open us up to what's been percolating along or been hanging out in the basement all along that we weren't that aware of. So maybe sometimes that irritability was just always there and now there's awareness of it. Or it could be that as we become more aware of ourselves through meditative practice and aware of the world around us, there are things about it that are irritating. You know, we're, we're, or sometimes as we deepen in our sense of peacefulness that we really like, the jostling of the hurly-burly of daily activity can become kind of annoying. It's like, uh, I like my meditative peacefulness and it's irritating that you all are talking so fast or rushing about or you want me to do things immediately. Ugh, I don't like that, right? Understandable, very understandable. Uh, the, 
path with that typically is to just keep practicing. And then what typically happens is a growing equanimity, a growing kind of sense of shock absorbers between us and the world. We, we, over time, we start feeling less raw, less sensitive, frankly. In other words, as our sensitivity to ourselves grows, we can become more sensitive to the world around us. And, you know, sometimes what happens is people make adjustments in their life. I, I have. Um, you know, more and more it just feels like um, you're almost like pressuring the inner horse or beast of your body mind. And increasingly it's just saying, no, I don't like being treated this way. There's something wrong about that, not harmonious, not true to my, my deep nature. I think of the uh, Coppola film some a couple decades ago, Koyana Squatsi. I think of the Hopi Indian native people term for life out of balance. We've, you know, with, with our growing sensitivity to ourselves, sometimes we do discern that our life is out of balance. So we need to start eating differently. We, we start disengaging from certain kinds of interactions with certain kinds of people. That's a normal process. And maybe with that comes up some aversion to the things that do feel disharmonious to who we are becoming or, or a kind of way of being that we become increasingly rested in. And we don't like it. We don't like it. So maybe that stuff comes up, but it's an intermediate. It's an intermediate step. And as many people say, you know, keep going. Keep going in a way that's skillful, but keep going. All right. Now, additionally, and here's where I want to talk about safety, and then I'm going to open it up. Um, earlier in the chat, I put the link both to this online course that's going to be opening up soon that I'm teaching, the Neurodharma online course. You might like to check it out, which is interesting as I talk about meditation. Also, based on the work of Professor Willoughby Britton, Cheetah House, and I think I can put it in here. I had a link, uh -huh. I had a link to Cheetah House, which is a place for meditators in distress. And if you've ever had painful, difficult, disorienting, destabilizing experiences in meditation, you're not alone. And I want to reiterate the sense of continuum of, of just mindfulness in general to meditative practice like at home to intensive retreats. There's a continuum of practice there. And even within retreats, there's definitely a continuum there as well. And so somewhere on that continuum, if you've had adverse experiences, disturbing experiences, even um, really wrenching, challenging experiences, you're not alone. And at Cheetah House, there are resources for people who've gone through that and you know a growing body of research related to this territory. I don't mean to alarm you. I just want to acknowledge that as we become more mindful, you know, we become more aware of things. And it's not necessarily that the mindfulness per se was the problem, because very often what we become aware of was already there. But still, if we're not resourced to handle what we become mindful of, uh, then it could feel upsetting. It could be um, discombobulating in a pretty serious way. It could. Um, particularly if we enter into that uh, awareness of what's bubbling up with some underlying vulnerabilities, such as an underlying background uh, with life experiences that have, in a sense, kind of fractured or fragmented our structure as a psyche and or tendencies toward dissociative or manic or even psychotic experiences those are, you know, kind of well-known vulnerabilities, and they are worthy of our respect and our care. And as part of that care, there can be a, a recognition that uh, people with those vulnerabilities, which might be you or me, uh, need to be particularly careful of uh, doing certain kinds of intensive practices. Uh, so uh, some keys here. Uh, first, it's to recognize that it's not always the meditation itself or the mindfulness itself that was the issue, but that what was already um, there, that surfaced 
in that setting. Second, to acknowledge that many people can ride out the waves, can ride out the storm, and what they're riding out is kind of a necessary intermediate stage to getting to a better place. Third, especially if you have some of these vulnerabilities, it's important to be careful about intensive practice and to do intensive practice in relationship with teachers or a community of practitioners who can be supportive and who can help you and advise you about whatever you're dealing with. Um, it's good to be able to disengage or to pull out of experiences that are uh, too much for you and to shift your gear into something that's more grounded and soothing, comfortable and, and easy for you. And also it's important to be able, if you are on retreat, and I've taught a number of retreats and where sometimes this has happened, to just kind of flag it uh, and ask to talk to a teacher. So I don't, like I said, mean to freak you out. Uh, most people meditate, most people are mindful, me included, and in most people do retreats in ways that are um, maybe you know painful, difficult things arise, uh, but they're manageable, they're they're recognized as kind of useful things to become aware of, even if they're painful and difficult. And, you know, we, we, get, we get through it okay. On the other hand, it is the case that, like anything, there are risks in doing anything and there are risks in not doing something. And we have to see these risks with our eyes wide open and, and judge and accordingly. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. Great. Um, I want to see if anybody, I saw that someone had their hand up. Um, hang on one second. It was Carol, I think. Carol, do you still have your hand up? Yes, you do. Carol, I'm going to, so if I call on you, if you could, for everybody's sake, including mine, ask a succinct question that's related to what I've been talking about. Okay. So Carol, I'm asking you to unmute. Can you unmute? Okay. It's succinct, all right. In fact, I put it in a private chat to you because I wasn't sure I wanted to make it public. But I'm going to make it public if I can remember exactly what I said. The first question that you were asked, the gentleman who said, my heart is a pump. Yeah. I have said more than once, my heart is a pump. I read the question differently. Why do we say... This is centered in the heart. Oh, okay. If I follow you right, um, that's a, I've wondered about that myself because the biological heart, unless, I mean, as far as we know, maybe there's subtle energy fields, the heart chakra and so forth. But generally speaking, you know, it doesn't feel things. So why do we say that? There are probably lots of reasons for it. I, I myself am not prepared to rule out subtle energies, the heart chakra, the fourth chakra, et cetera, et cetera. Beyond that, uh, as Steve Porges has in his pioneering work on polyvagal theory developed, um, the vagus nerve complex to simplify a lot of stuff uh, has its early original branch regulating the organs um, you know, in the viscera. And then its most recent branch uh, also uh, has fibers that go into the heart and are very involved coming up into the face in terms of facial expressions with the social engagement network. This means that as we experience um, loving emotions, compassion, kindness, friendliness, you know, delight in others. Someone was showing me kitten videos earlier today and like, oh, those kittens look so cute and so forth and so forth. Um, you know, as that kind of happens, there are sensations in the area physically of the heart. So maybe that's why over time people have made that association. Um, and But more broadly, uh, this was someone who was hearing my suggestion about um, an you know, an emotion, let's say, of compassion or friendliness or kindness. And for them, it they just couldn't relate to it because it just seemed so concrete for them to think of the physical heart. And that's a general point that uh, if you're engaged with different prompts that are in which you're trying to help yourself have an experience, remember, we grow through having experiences that we internalize, two-step process necessary and sufficient. 
but necessary two steps. So that was a person who just couldn't relate to my prompts. And the takeaway is find different prompts, find what works for you. My style is going to come from a certain place, certain collection of privileges, um, you know, find different uh, prompts that work for you. Okay, so I see another person had their hand up. Um, let's see, I saw Hannah and then Jyoti, uh, and then I'll bounce out to the um, sidebar, the chat sidebar. Okay, so Hannah, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Question about why and how to meditate. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for all your work. It's been so healing for me listening to you. Oh, I wow. have. And that's a good sign about you that, you know, that the, you could get benefit from it. That's a really good indicator and that you earned your benefits. Good. Thank you. With lots of listening to your podcasts and videos. So <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering when I when I'm holding a meditative state and I'm speaking to people, I feel like I tend to be uh, more boring as opposed to just getting lost and, 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 and really into the conversation with people like, like you would at work. Like when you get absorbed in your work and you forget that you exist and you do the best job. Yeah. But then when we do, when I do that and I'm not in the meditative state, I find that I get into anxiety. I, like I function from an anxiety, an anxious type of state. Mm. Do you have any um, suggestions of how can, can to- Can you help me understand, Hannah? Um, what, what, what do you mean meditative state? And how does the meditative state include anxiety? Yeah, so the meditative state does not include anxiety. The meditative state is a state that, uh, from listening to your work, like you, uh, you teach that we can do anything in a meditative state. Yeah. So whether it's like in your son was saying, like washing your hands or doing anything, right. you can just be conscious of, I am yeah. doing this right now. And this is what it feels like. Yeah. When I have conversations from that place with people, I tend to be um, very, it's, I don't know if it's like boring or um, I'm not very absorbed in there. I'm not as empathetic or able to put myself in their shoes as okay. I am if I don't do that. But then if I don't do that, I'm anxious and I'm like tired and exhausted after the conversation. You mean when you put yourself very much in their shoes, you are you get anxious and you're tired after the conversation? Yeah, and like I lose track. I'm not in the meditative state and then I lose track of me. Yeah. But then it's, in the meditative state, I, I, I appear boring and... Because you're kind of self-oriented, you're self-focused, like, right? Yeah, that's great. So the... The sweet spot, of course, like I'm hearing you ask for, is um, how to be really present with another person and over there with them in a way in which over here you're not stressing, you're not feeling anxious, you're feeling, you're feeling okay already while you're over there and really interested in them, right? And yeah, we all want to be there. <laughs> And me too. <laughs> it's good. Um, and, and I think that's what we're talking about here, right? So um, to me, what you're describing in a way is a, is a kind of a flow state in which there's how I, I would describe it for myself. I, I mean, I'm kind of in it with you right now, right? We're aware of each other. We're tuning into each other. Um, you know, Dan Siegel talks about a kind of presence, a certain mutual presence of rapport, a mui, as he puts it, and in which there's a quality of delight and energy with ongoing present moment awareness. There is a quality of recollectedness, you know. Now, it is true that sometimes as we heighten that internal sense of recollecting ourselves over here, we lose touch with them over there. And that's what I think you're talking about, that growing edge to be able to have just enough, just enough mooring or connection over here to be able to really be over there. Yes. Yeah. And that, that might be what you're really talking about developing and growing and growing in the capacity for. Um, I, I find for myself, understandably, if we feel over here uh, disturbed or that something's missing, you know, disturbance or deficit, something's wrong or something's missing, which then triggers a survival reaction that moves us into the drive state of craving. Mm 
As soon as we go there, then we do tend to contract and we're over here, right? And we tend to lose present moment self-awareness and we get caught up in, what am I gonna do? We get flooded with anxiety or anger or other kinds of things. Ugh. So it's promoting of relatedness to try to help yourself feel, you know, basically okay, right? Uh, not too much stress, not too much pressure on yourself. I'll tell you, maybe I'll finish on this one. I don't know if you can relate to it. I was a really shy, insecure, inadequate, highly neurotic. You think Woody Allen in his early movies was nutty? I was nuttier. And one thing I discovered was that it really helped me with my shyness and social anxiety to disengage from being over here and to be really interested in them over there, which took the pressure off me, started getting me positive feedback because people like others who are interested in them. And I didn't have to come up with all kinds of witty things. And I was genuinely interested. It wasn't robotic. You know, I'm naturally kind of empathic and warm and I could just follow that. I was interested. And I, you know, like, don't know, right? That kind of beginner's mind attitude brought to other people. You're interested. There's always something interesting in other people. Uh, what was it like when? Or can you tell me more about that. Or, you know, a genuine kind of interest. And that relieved a lot of social pressure on me, which then enabled me, um, partly because I wasn't so self-preoccupied and self-conscious. It also helped me become, you know, more kind of meditatively mindful, almost while I was talking with other people. I don't know. What do, you, what do you make of all that that I want to hear from Jyoti? Mm, yeah, thank you. I, I, I feel like what resonated with me is take the pressure off myself a little bit. Totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. When we're, when we're feeling pressured, like where something's missing, that's why being, that place I talked about in meditation, like, you know, being is ineradicable. We cannot eradicate it. We're always being. We cannot lose it, right? We can find it, but never lost. And though, but occasionally found. <laughs> being, right? And that's our fundamental refuge to kind of drop into being, you know, and then see what appropriate action might might come. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, Hannah. Thank you. Okay, Jyoti. Has to unmute. Great. You're unmuted. And am I pronouncing your name correctly? How do you say it? It's uh, Jyoti. Good. Okay. Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. Okay. So um, I had a question like about the meditations. They're really um, like relaxing when I do them, but like um, sometimes when I uh, do them, I, um, I get like sometimes anxious with like loads of thoughts in my mind. Yeah. They crop up. So like, do you have any um, suggestions to like um, make me less overwhelmed? Sure. Do you mind if I ask, and Jyoti, just say whatever you feel comfortable saying. Uh, is there a pattern to feeling flooded with thoughts and feeling anxious? Like when you meditate, does there some, is there something that's happening just before you get anxious and full of thought? Um, like sometimes I get like a feeling in my um, like chest, like something is, um, you know, mm -hmm. troubling me sometimes and yeah. Yeah. Well, if I follow you right, first, when we meditate, sometimes you know, like our mind is normally so busy often in modern life. Yeah. That when it gets less busy, we become aware of things we've maybe pushed away or pushed down. Uh, and even things that we, you know, thought we put behind ourselves years ago, they come forward very powerfully. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a really natural thing. And um, if particularly, and different people have had different histories, you know, personal backgrounds, right? And so if, if, if you do have a sense that in kind of the, like the mind is like a house, you know, in the basement or in some rooms are things that are maybe painful or scary, then it's especially important to 
kind of lay a foundation of connection, being in touch with things that feel kind of comforting, calming, you know, supportive, positive. Maybe it might help to like meditate with eyes open and just sort of be aware of what you, the situation you're in or just look at a flower. Okay. Or, or maybe meditate on the sensation of like a soothing cloth on your cheek or, you know, just, or a sense of gratitude or like I did a lot of catitation, you know, our cat would sit in my lap while I meditated. Uh, that was comforting, you know, maybe just something that's supportive, you know, that's supportive. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I'll do that. Second suggestion, this is a general point that's really useful in general, not just for meditation. Mm -hmm. It's that the body is wonky. <laughs> what I mean is the body, everybody's body, and frankly, especially women who are have a more complicated body typically than a male body because they have to be able to make the most complicated organ the body has, which is another human being. So it's it's really complicated. And also women tend to be, as a group of people, more mistreated as a group of people than men and take stuff into their body. So for all kinds of reasons, all kinds of reasons, for whoever you are, there's a lot going on in the body. And when something is a little funky in the body, like maybe some food we're digesting or some hormonal balance or some little wiggle in the immune system, could be almost anything really, the heart starts beating a little funny, anything that's a little out of normal, let's say, or a little problematic in, the, in just the body, just the meat, okay, it sends an alarm signal up into your brain. Uh. You know, your stomach's a little funky, your digestion's a little funky, your hormones are a little wobbly, your immune system is inflaming, there's a little inflammation. And then in your, in, and basically the body is telling the brain, Rut row, <laughs> you know, rut row. As, but in your, but then you, then the mind interprets that as a signal that something must be wrong. Yeah. Right, and that, and with it comes anxiety. So it's it's actually quite helpful to appreciate that very often these sort of primal signals that are just biological don't mean anything. Oh, okay. That's the takeaway. Okay, yeah, because I was like, oh, when I was feeling anxious um, with mm -hmm. like thoughts while I was doing the meditation, I was like, oh, this doesn't feel normal. Yeah, maybe it doesn't. And so we, we, we give it meaning, but maybe it doesn't need to mean anything. Yeah. You know, we, and, and that's true in general often. We'll have thoughts or feelings or we'll get a vibe. Often it doesn't mean anything. Now, wisdom, of course, is recognizing when it does. When you're getting a vibe around that person, you know, in your life, and that vibe is trying to tell you something useful. That person's not really a true friend, maybe, for example. Um, so that would, that's another thing, too, is just to, you know, okay, and, and to regard anxiety in a more impersonal way. Oh, okay. This is true in general for, for people. Like, sometimes anxiety is a signal that there's something important to pay attention to. Uh -huh. But when you have looked around and you're like, I don't see it. Or, well, I, I see the thing to pay attention to, but I got I made my plan, I'm doing what I can. Yeah. You know? And then it's time to hang up the phone. It's time to move on. At a certain point, you just say to the anxiety, you know, I hear you, you're there. You're you're an unpleasant noise in the background. You're an unpleasant feeling, but I don't need to believe you. Oh, okay. I don't need to identify with you. You're over there. I'm over here. Oh, okay. That's yeah. a good suggestion, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I I'll finish on this point, which is, I think it's important to appreciate, as, as animals, how vulnerable we are to fear. We are. You know. I don't care how tough a person looks or how on top of the food chain they seem to be. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're all frail, we're all vulnerable, we're all afraid to die, you know, it's real. We and we or we're we're afraid to lose others. Like someone spoke of losing a beloved cat. We lost our own um, beloved cat some weeks ago for different reasons. So yeah, things happen. 
Um, and I, that's why for me is, um, you know, there's certain practices or ideas that just seem more and more important, honestly, the more experienced I get with practice and reassurance. Yeah. Comfort, soothing, settling, you know, to have the humility, the healthy humility to recognize how vulnerable we all are and how important safety is and things that foster the sense of safety. Wow. You know, that's really good. And and so that turn emphasizing that in your life as well, GOT, or during meditation. You know, like what I'll do is I'll I'll come into the present and I'll go, Am I okay right now? And I am basically okay right now. Heart is beating, still breathing. You know, I try to understand what is my anxiety telling me. Mm-hmm. And then when I understand it, then I can move on from it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um yeah, your suggestion. Said- yeah. You keep turning back to what's comforting and soothing. Okay. Well, yeah, I've thank settled. You. Thank yeah. you for your suggestions. I'll try them out. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you all for hanging in here uh, with all this. I went a little long. I got it. Um, and uh, thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> the Meditation Express. Uh, how about you just sort of let it settle for a few breaths here with me? And I guess what's there for me, especially about this, is courage. You know, recognizing the difficulty and the preciousness of this life. Yes, there are risks. And there are risks in not taking a step. There are risks in taking a step, and there are risks in not taking a step. And, um, you know, with appropriate caution, And I think there's a place for courage, you know, each step at a time.